Well, welcome to my chambers here in San Diego. I am sorry not to be able to be with you, but uh, June is a very busy month for me, so I'm hoping that I can be somewhat helpful to you today in talking about some of the cases that I've had in the United States and some successful efforts to collect assets from overseas. I decided uh, I was asked to talk about my experience and I decided not to focus on dealing with treaties and the more seriously legal side, because that is a very case by case uh, determination. Instead, what I want to do in our 20 minutes here today is to talk about three cases where we had very good results through using what I'll call the power of persuasion, practical things that you can do, I think, in any country, anywhere, by using the power you have where you have power. I gave some extensive materials, and there are a lot of exhibits to them, so I hope that those are available to you, and after my talk, you can look at those, and maybe they will help you in the future. Um, the first case I want to talk about is, is actually two cases. The Dauber cases, uh, there's Mr. Dauber, who filed a Chapter 11 in the United States, and Class War, an entity that he controlled. And the history of the case is, is pretty simple. Mr. Dauber had a business partner. The business partner um, was ousted from the business and sued him in California State court and won a substantial judgment, a multi-million dollar judgment. Mr. Dauber didn't want to pay it. And so he did several things. He appealed from the judgment. He filed a bankruptcy for himself and he filed a bankruptcy for his company. And that's all very fine and good. Uh, but he also did some other things. And the main thing he did that was a problem was by the time I got the bankruptcy cases, the assets of the partnership were gone. They were all allegedly held in Singapore by a Singaporean company properly set up under Singapore law. The assets were out of the jurisdiction of the United States. We're mostly talking about intangible assets. Um, it was an intellectual property case, so we're talking about intellectual property and the receivables from that intellectual property. The principal creditor was furious, and I very quickly identified the case as one where there had been, in all probability, a very serious fraud. What do you do? So the first thing that I did, which is discussed in the materials, is we did investigation. Now, it, it seldom, when you have someone who is really out there to commit fraud, it's seldom going to be the case where they say, yes, I committed fraud. Here's the information. And so at the request of um, one of the, the principal creditor, I was asked to either dismiss the case, appoint a trustee, or put someone in to investigate. And that's what I did. I appointed an examiner. Under United States law, an examiner is an independent third party, and that's the independence is very important because oftentimes it's very difficult when you have even your trustees, um, they're, they're, they become involved in the case. Certainly, uh, the, the, the creditors are involved. So this independent third party works in effect for me, and he does what I tell him to do by court order. And so I appointed him to look into the situation and to figure out why there were no assets in this estate, where they had gone. In the materials, you're going to see a series of orders that I entered. The first order is one that uh, was proposed by the creditor, and you'll see some entries in red. I read through it carefully, and I added and clarified some things here um, that I thought were important to make sure that the examiner again is doing what I want him to do. The second order was one where the examiner came in and said, I need some clarification. He wanted to know, can I hire an attorney? I said, yes. 
can I hire accountants or anybody else? I said, absolutely. He wanted to know whether he could issue subpoenas under um, what we call rule 2004 without further court order. So I said yes. And then finally, there's an order where he's now into the process. He's found assets. He's discovered a serious fraud, very serious fraud. And so he's asking, is it OK if I expand my powers, judge? And in addition to telling you what happened. Make suggestions for how to return the assets and what legal action should be taken. And so I expanded his powers. So the point is, if you can get a third party in there to do things for you as the judicial officer, as a trustee, as the person in charge, make sure that you are very involved in the process going forward and that you're giving them really good information on an ongoing basis. Expand the role if you need to. Make sure that they're using all their time and talents to your benefit. So having identified, yes, a very serious fraud, uh, there was a problem because what we found was that my debtor, Mr. Dauber, owned or controlled the Singaporean entity. But the entity's in Singapore. It's been properly formed. And I don't know what your experience is in Asia, but that government's going to be very protective of that entity. So the first hearing I have where where I asked the Singaporean entity to come in and talk to me, they had a very good lawyer who says, eh, you can't do anything, judge. You don't have jurisdiction in Singapore. You don't have jurisdiction over the people running the company in Singapore. We don't have to obey your orders. And you know what? They're absolutely correct. So this is where I think you have to think about what it is that you can control. What is going to give you the power to control this entity, which at this point, let's be honest, is in free fall. They are um, moving forward and doing whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. But I do have some power under our laws. I have jurisdiction over all the assets wherever located. And I have jurisdiction over all the people. In the United States. And in the background of all this, I also know that there's been a serious bankruptcy fraud, which is a crime under federal law of the United States. Now, I don't it's inappropriate for me to say in a courtroom that I'm going to have you criminally prosecuted. It's not my decision. It is the United States attorney's decision. Uh, I can't guarantee it'll happen and it's not considered judicially appropriate, but every single person in that courtroom knows that I have an obligation to at least report it to the United States attorney. So I now have two kinds of conversion or excuse me, coercion. I can coerce quietly with the knowledge that if these people don't work with me, a criminal referral probably has already been made. Their lives are not getting much better. And I can control assets. And the control of assets is what I did. Um, you can see in my materials, I gave you the receiver's report, or excuse me, the examiner's report, which tells you everything was going on. It's pretty long. It's actually very interesting, I think. So it gives you an idea of what, a what the examiner gave to me that made me confident that there were assets. And then, I exercised the power that I had. I said, you're right, counsel. I can't do things to people in Singapore. But this company's market is entirely at this point in the United States. And so all the money to fund the Singaporean company is going to move from the United States to Singapore. Unless I stop it. And I am. And so you'll see in the materials um, some orders that I entered in joining the flow of money out of the country. I said, I believe those are estate assets. Mr. Dauber didn't disclose it. He was hiding it, but ultimately it's his. So it should all be coming into my bankruptcy. And so I required all the money to be placed in blocked accounts. I mentioned to the attorney 
that he had, who had received, it turns out, a very substantial retainer, that he also couldn't spend it probably because I wasn't going to enjoy it right now. I'd let him be heard, but that was probably a state asset. He was on notice as an officer of the court. Lawyers get very nervous when they don't think they can get paid. And so the combination of these factors, this ongoing coercive uh, power, using the power I had, being aware of the power I didn't had, have led to a good result. We, in fact, got the Singaporean entity finally to agree to transfer ownership of all the intellectual property back. We didn't file a single thing in Singapore before this happened. We did it because we controlled the assets in the United States and made it economically um, unattractive for them not to work with us. In addition, we used softly the power we had over Mr. Dauber and, the, and a whole variety of people, including whole law firms, um, with the, the possibility of at least a criminal investigation. The result in the case is that every single creditor was paid their agreed upon claim in full. All administrative claims were paid. And Mr. Dauber kept his home and is going to get money back. The other piece of this that was very helpful was this business. Um, you'll see some examples in the examiner's report. Mr. Dauber is an artist. He designs really, in my view, unattractive T-shirts that are worn by skateboarding teenagers. But during the recession, there was apparently a huge market for bad T-shirts. And because of the coercive power that we had placed in on him, Mr. Dauber agreed to continue to work for the debtor. We could not compel that. But he did it consensually. And so again, this business not only survived, it thrives. I'm convinced that if we tried to go to Singapore and fight the battle directly there, we would still be fighting it and we would not be nearly as successful. So the takeaway on this one is use the power you have. The next case I want to talk about is one that I handled as an appellate judge. I sit on the Ninth Circuit bankruptcy appellate panel and we actually review the bankruptcy decisions of other judges uh, and then if our decisions can be further appealed. The question was about a tool called a consent directive. And my opinion is in the materials. Um, if they're tabbed, it's at tab six. The bankruptcy judge um, in the Maestro case had a real problem. Mr. Maestro had perpetrated a multi-million dollar fraud in Washington state. He then got in a camper with his wife and their jewelry and their small dogs, drove apparently all up and down the Americas, finally went to Canada, and then they managed to get to the beautiful lakeside community of Anna Seafrance. So they're in France, they're living the good life. The French refuse extradition uh, because they're in their 80s on humanitarian grounds. They said, we know he's probably a criminal, but we're not sending him to you. Uh, so what's, what's a bankruptcy trustee to do? Because he can see that he has assets in the United States, but he can see that they are living a wonderful lifestyle in France, a very high flying lifestyle. He knows they have money. He knows it's an asset of the estate. And he's pretty sure, based on some information he has, that the money is coming from bank accounts in Switzerland and France. And neither of those countries are particularly cooperative in giving information of the banking authorities. So he asked the bankruptcy judge to use something called a consent directive. And this is a tool that, frankly, I had never heard of when I got the appellate case. Um, it's usually used in criminal um, investigations, it's, and it's used by federal agencies such as the IRS, the SEC, et cetera. But it isn't used widely in private practice, which is where, where I was, and certainly not in bankruptcy. Consent directive is a document signed by the party, the debtor in this case, and it says to foreign banks, and only foreign banks, you can't use it in the United States, 
it says, I, I'm not saying I have a bank account with you, but if I do, I'm agreeing that you can give these good people all the information about my bank account. It, it, and it's important that it's written that way for a couple of reasons. The main one in the United States being that we do not require people to testify to, against themselves. And the United States Supreme Court, um, these, these started being widely used in the 80s, determined that uh, signing a consent directive is not testimonial, and so it doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment privilege to not self-incriminate. So I knew there was a constitutional challenge to this. As an appellate judge, I said, you don't have a constitutional problem. The bankruptcy judge said, I can't do it. I said, well, you don't have a constitutional problem. The Supreme Court has already decided that this is OK. What you might have is a problem. Because what's the basis for this? It's not specifically mentioned in the bankruptcy code, for example. You're not going to find consent directives listed in the list of things you can do. And so it required me to analyze the powers of a trustee in bankruptcy and the duties of a debtor. And I concluded that a consent directive was just OK. What what I said was, and I believe this is true in all bankruptcy systems. We have people like trustees or state administrators who have the obligation to investigate by statute. They have the obligation to muster assets by statute. And they have the power by statute to compel cooperation. On the other side of this, we have a debtor who having accessed the bankruptcy system has an obligation to give information to assist the trustee and to make assets available. And so when you take those statutory mandates, those statutory duties, those statutory imper imperatives and put them together, what we have is a situation where we can say with great certainty that the statute is consistent with a consent directive, that it's a tool that should be used. I tied it to specific statutory requirements. Um, in it, I found things that I didn't think worked, like the All Writs Act, but I found that it was appropriate in a bankruptcy setting. We told the bankruptcy judge, however, that that was the, as far as we were going. We said, we'll, we'll say that you were wrong in saying you can't do it, but we're not going to compel you to do it because you need to look carefully at each situation and determine whether this tool is one you should use. And we suggested two things to the court. One, that they consider issues of comity. We said you really need to look at whether this is going to be inconsistent with the law of the countries where you're going to use it. And if it is, you need to consider maybe denying the request on that basis. So there may be some places in the world where this just simply wouldn't work because I'm thinking the Cayman Islands, um, because their laws would be wholly inconsistent with it. Um, but we left that to the bankruptcy judge. That's your job to figure out. The next thing that we said was we suggested that that they consider sort of some principles of due process because these are sort of um, freewheeling orders. So we said you might want to import some due process from other areas of the law. I went back in preparation for this program and went into the docket in the Washington uh, Bankruptcy Court and the judge took all of what we suggested to heart. First on principles of comity, the trustee came back and requested a consent directives again. Uh, but it supported the request with declarations from a French lawyer and a Swiss lawyer. Both of them gave some things that said that this would not be inconsistent with the laws of France or Switzerland, although they suggested certain things that needed to happen. They also suggested certain due process that would be provided. And as a result of that request, the judge issued the consent directive order he uh, provided that there would be substantial monetary sanctions if the debtor didn't comply and 
kind of to my surprise, the debtor executed 20 consent directives that went to various French and Swiss banks. Obviously, there's the opportunity to go back for more. It appears that some of them have identified some account information and the uh, the trustee in that case, together with the court, is now working with, in particular, French authorities to get more information and get control of some assets. So again, what happened there? This is an interesting tool. It's not a tool that's really um, statutorily based. So I don't think it's something where I can say you have to have a US law to use this. I think it's something that you could consider in any jurisdiction in bringing into your jurisprudence. Because what you're doing with this particular tool is asking the debtor to come clean. To just tell somebody else to tell you what they have. Now I know that we can all make banks in our own country do that. But this is a tool not intended to be used where we have jurisdiction. It's intended to be used to get us information about where assets were may, may be out of the country. In this case, it was very successful in identifying the assets and it looks like it's gonna result in some significant recoveries. Uh, the final case I wanna talk about is, is um, I know that I'm sort of the end of your day and so I thought we all needed a little bit of humor. And this is the most um, subtle of the cases. It's also one of my oldest. I was a very new bankruptcy judge and I inherited a case from another judge. The, it was an individual case, a, a debtor, a lawyer. And it was clear from the very beginning that he had committed a wide variety of bankruptcy frauds, mostly in the nature of very small dollar non-disclosures. Uh, probably the most annoying thing you could see because none of them were big enough to really get too excited about. Cumulatively, it was, you know, maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. I wasn't gonna get a criminal prosecution based on that, although I had to refer it criminally. And in most cases, the lawyers for the trustee would have said, not worth our time. But my debtor, Mr. Yates, ran into probably the most persistent lawyer I know. And he also managed to irritate her significantly. So she would not let it go. She went through masses of information and identified at least one check that appeared to have been endorsed to a Swiss bank. Now, all debtors in bankruptcy are required to say, with precision, whether they have foreign bank accounts. And my debtor, Mr. Yates, had said quite clearly, I have no foreign bank accounts, none. But there was this one piece of information indicating that he was lying. So the trustee wrote a bevy of letters to this bank and got no response. A consent directive would have been a good idea, but again, she didn't know about him. She didn't ask me for one. And the Swiss, as is their want, were very, very quiet. But in the background, things were happening. As I mentioned, I did a criminal referral on this, and Mr. Yates eventually started taking the Fifth Amendment. And eventually, there was a raid at his home. The IRS and the FBI went in, seized Mr. Yates, seized his computer, and seized all his paper documents. At that point, he was uh, much older than I was. He was well into his 70s. And so he had everything on paper. And including in paper was a file called Recent Swiss. And it was all his correspondence with the Swiss bankers. Because while the Swiss bankers were not talking to the trustee, the trustee's efforts had been fruitful. They were talking to Mr. Yates. And they said, oh, nice Mr. Yates. We think there's a problem here. You put this money in our account. You want it back. We're not going to give it to you because we think you've been involved in criminal activity in the United States and our laws don't allow us to cooperate with you. But we have a deal for you. If you will uh, pay for a lawyer who we hire and if that lawyer tells us that there's no violation of 
American law in doing what you're doing, you'll get your money. Until then, you won't. So the trustee's efforts, but for the criminal prosecution, might never have borne fruit, but Mr. Yates was never getting his money. At some point, there was a deal to be done. And in fact, as a result of the criminal prosecution, Mr. Yates finally agreed to expatriate hundreds of thousands of dollars from Switzerland and some money from China, which the FBI found. And that money all came into the estate. He did that so that his time in federal prison was lessened. He ended up spending almost two years as a, um, as a tenant of the federal penal system, which is not a great place to be, especially if you're in your 70s. So I guess that one is, is amusing to me because of the position of the Swiss, but I hope it gives you some hope. Because even if you don't see things happening immediately, corresponding with even the, the most secretive of entities, telling them what's going on, maybe putting subtle pressure on your borrower. I think eventually we would have gotten some of that money in any event, because Mr. Yates was fairly desperate at that point. So there was a deal to be done, even absent the criminal prosecution. So those are three stories from my personal experience. Uh, I think I'm about at the end of my 20 minutes, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. 